I'm pleased to welcome back to British television a man who hasn't been seen on it for a thousand years. Mind you, he's seen every second week in one of those endless carry-on movie reruns. He's a comedian turned pop star, a film composer, a film star, and most recently, one of the biggest stars on Broadway's Great White Way. It's Jim Dale. <laughs> it was nearly ten years since you were interviewed on, on British television. Yes, it was in a studio. The last time I was interviewed was by a, a young uh, disc jockey, remarkably like you. It was. It was your program, too. On the old radio? Yes, absolutely. Ten years ago. Yeah. That was the very last time. Well, you've worn a lot of hats in the meantime, and indeed before that. What are you, what are you, what are you most recognized for in Britain now? Oh, in Britain, it would, it would have to be the carry-on films. Um, <laughs> I get How long ago did you make the last one? About out? 15 to 20 years ago. Well, in America, the, the carry-ons have become a sort of a, sort of cult film in America, but only to insomniacs. You know, at 4 a.m. you can watch the carry-on films, and I, I often meet sleepy-eyed people in the street saying, hey, man, you're that guy. <laughs> They're the only people who recognize Do you watch them yourself me. now? You... No, but I have them all on tape. Yeah. You know, of course, I, 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 I think it was a marvelous period of English cinema that we captured. Uh, it was a period of English humor that we had to, well, you know, in, in the past 100 years, we've never been able to do that until television or yeah. film. But yes, put it in the archives. It was a marvelous moment of English comedic history. Yes, and it's the kind of thing that, that goes, it's the kind of thing they think of in America as British humor, isn't it? Absolutely. Rather like Benny Hill. It's got knockabout and knickers and all that kind of stuff. That's right, yes. Yeah. Crude, but why not? Yes. Yes. You, were, you were a pop star before even Cliff Richard, weren't you? Remember Six Five Special yes, and all I those know, things? Yes. Actually, long before Cliff, we were doing Six Five Special and they, they were holding auditions. And uh, a young boy came along and he had sideburns down, but sideboards down here. And he sang a song and Dennis Main Wilson, the producer, said to me, um, what do you think of him? I said, well, it sounds a lot like Elvis Presley. He said, right, son, who are you? He said, Cliff Richard. He said, right, thank you, no more, off you go. Next one, please. And so, poor Cliff was actually sacked before he even got his first job for the yeah. BBC. What ever happened to him? I don't know. <laughs> he aged very well. Does he I speak to you now? Oh, he does, yes. <laughs> just, <laughs> That's just good. When we meet. That's good. Do you ever meet uh, ladies of a certain vintage who used to scream at you in the 50s? Yes, but they're, you know, much older now. Oh, I remember you when I was at school. That's that great. It makes you feel and, uh, good, that. Yeah. It does, but uh, no, I, I don't meet many of them these days, not over here. You actually started as a stand-up comic. Did you ever play the old Shepherd's Bush Empire here? I, I was on a bill here with uh, a wonderful old comedian called Max Miller. Yeah. And uh, I actually did the a comedy... The Cheeky Chappy. The Cheeky Chappy, yes. I did a comedy act here as Jim Smith, and I was just about to join the Royal Air Force, and uh, I thought I'll do a comedy act where I'm called up on the stage. So I had two men dressed as, as police officers, airmen police officers, and they arrested me on the stage for not reporting to Padgate. And it got a big, big laugh, me desperately trying to do my act and being marched off. I got to Padgate and they were waiting for me and they said, uh, out of all the 1800 new recruits, anybody's name here is Smith? And of course, 100 stood up. He said, Jim Smith, and a 99 sat down. And he said, yes, you come out here, lad, and stand on that table. And I stood on, and he said to the crowd, he said, we don't mind you taking the mickey out of the RAF. You know, we all do it in our own way. But when you've got the gall to do it in front of three or four million people, that's going a little too far, isn't it, lad? And instead of eight weeks training, I stayed at Padgate training camp for 14 months. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. But it prepared you for the challenges it did. of, no, it was, of future that, life. That was the best thing that could have happened because in those days they needed camp shows every other week. And, you know, I, I spent my time producing camp shows with maybe a chorus line of boys who had been farmers and coal miners. And now they were dressed as women's costume doing La Cage au Folle. It was mm. type mm. of shows, you know. So private on parade stuff. Yes, it was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Really From was. a pop star, then you, you seem to make a leap to be a Shakespearean actor. I mean, they tell me that... You partly expressing your bottom was something to remark about. Oh, my bottom was my best part, I think, yes. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, was in, I was doing it with uh, Cleo Lane. She was playing Titania at the uh, um, assembly rooms at the Edinburgh Festival. And uh, I had this head, it was a wonderful ass's head. And I used to come off the stage and I had about 30 seconds to put it on and then go on the stage again and go, like that. Frank Dunlop, the director, had a marvelous idea and he thought he would get about 24 Bassett hounds 
and a hunter to come down the aisles blowing the, for, the, for the woodland scene with the lovers. And he did this, and 24 basset hounds came racing down. We'd never seen these dogs before, and they bounded on the stage, they sniffed around me, and they all went off the stage to the hunter's horn, and there was my ass's head. And all of them sniffed it, and all of them cocked their leg, <laughs> and all of them did it on my ass's head. Not one, but 24 of them. Now, I come off, I've got 30 seconds. I said, how's it going? Fine, yeah. pick the ass's head up. I thought, it's dripping, what's, what's wrong with it? Put it up, oh, pow! <laughs> I just, what, what is this? Then the stage manager said, I've got some powder, love. It'll be all right, powder. Very nice. And she's doing that with the powder and the top came off. All the powder went in, unbeknown to me, because I'm, well, I said, come on. I put the ass's head on, walked out and went, <laughs> and a cloud of powder came out that was about 30 foot long. It brought the house down. Yeah. It brought the house down. Yes. So Good. that was my experience. Your big, your big success was, was when you moved to Broadway with Scapino, the, the musical version of Molière Scapino. That's right. That was an enormous success, wasn't it? That was we, we over here don't realize the enormous amount of success you've had on Broadway. It was Scapino first, and then Barnum. Yes. The thing that Michael Crawford is associated with here. Yes. You, you actually started, you initiated that part in your That's project. right, yes. When we, when we got the, the actual script part, it was just very basic. He walks on and he climbs up to visit his wife. And things like this. So I realized that there needed to be more movement in it. And I thought, well, here's my chance to do or instigate something that would, could possibly be the most exhausting role ever. I didn't realize it would be. And so I, I started suggesting things, type ropes, this, that, and the other. And I knew very well that if I couldn't do it within 10 weeks of rehearsal, we could easily change it, and I could walk across and climb up. But if I did do it, then it meant I had to do it every night, and the trampoline work. So you had to be exceedingly fit to do it. And uh, two years of that can really knock you out. Ask Michael. Mm. How long did it take you to, to learn the old type high wire act? Well, it took, me about, it took me about 10 weeks, I suppose. It took Michael about 10. It took all of us. Um, but the state, I've been explaining this, that on a 34-foot tightrope, there comes a time when everybody's had a go on it. Not only the cast, and they can walk it eventually over the months, but it, the stagehands. And I can remember seeing these big American stagehands, not with ballet shoes being all balletted, <laughs> but with big boots on, walking 34 feet across the tightrope. So anybody can walk a tightrope after 10 weeks? Yes, the first thing you learn is how to fall off it, but eventually you can stay <laughs> on it. Yeah. So what are you doing while you're here? Oh, it's been marvelous because um, I visit the, the boys and my relatives yeah. over here as much as possible. And uh, this particular time, I'm lucky enough to, you've got this marvelous exhibition. It's the Fine Arts and uh, Antiques exhibition yeah. at Olympia. That is my favorite because it's like a, one giant fun fair. And I, I love antiques and I've been collecting for years. And so uh, I came over to go to see some very old friends there, a lot of the dealers. Not yeah. dealers who sell things for 100,000. I mean, there are people there with stuff on the, for sale for five pounds, you know, yeah. and you could go and just choose and pick. Maybe find something you've got in the attic and it's worth a lot of money, or yeah. maybe find something that can start you collecting, you know. But it's a wonderful um, hobby. Uh, you meet a lot of new people, like the, the dealers. Yes. So you've got to go back to, to Broadway again? You've got to open it, anything new? Yes, the last thing was Joe Egg. The results of Joe Egg were so successful, you know, artistically, um, that I've been asked to uh, do, if I tell it now, it'll, it's bound to fall through, you know, right. they always do. So um, when it's signed, sealed and delivered, I'll drop you a note. But yes, it's to do with Broadway and it's to do with next season on Broadway. Well, we wish you luck. Continued success. Thank there. you very Jim much. Jim Dale. Thank you.